Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Who holds the reins of power in Pakistan? Prime Minister Imran Khan leads a government elected in 2018. If Pakistan is a genuine democracy, then that is where power resides. But many government critics say the military dictates much that happens inside Pakistan, particularly when it comes to silencing opposition to the covert power of the so-called deep state. Well, my guest is Information Minister Fawad Chowdhury. What happened to Imran Khan's pledge to deliver clean, transparent governance? Fawad Chowdhury in Islamabad, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me. Minister, do you accept it is a basic obligation of any government which claims to be democratic that it protects freedom of expression and it protects independent journalism? Do you accept that? Of course. This is one of the fundamental of uh, Pakistan's constitution inside in Article 19 of our constitution. But the problem you have, Minister, is that it is quite clear day after day, month after month, that your government isn't protecting journalists and isn't protecting freedom of speech. Well, I, uh, I will obviously contest this claim because, you know, Pakistan is probably one of the freest uh, uh, state as far as media is concerned. We have about 43 international channels, including uh, BBC here in Pakistan. We have 112 of uh, our own private channels, 258 uh, FM channels, and 1,569 print publications. So you can imagine the kind of uh, media we have, the kind, uh, the size of media itself define your claim. So Pakistan Minister. is certainly one of the most... Yeah, Minister, I, I, I sense you're reading some of those figures off some notes, and if you are reading assiduously, you'll have read in the overnight uh, media reporting of the uh, attack on a leading independent journalist and YouTuber, Assad Ali Tour. Now, you know that gun, uh, gunmen entered uh, his residence, they threatened him, they beat him brutally, and they did all of that in the name of the ISI, Pakistan's intelligence service. That happened within the last 24 hours. Well, yes, there has been an incident. I took notice of that incident last night. I sent uh, the uh, senior police officers to investigate the case. We have found even the CC footages. We got the we we, have, we we got the footages of the people who were involved in this case, and people will be apprehended. But uh, it's a bit fashionable for the Western media to accuse ISI on every uh, time when such incidents happen. And I know that there has been a history of uh, uh, people using uh, and taking names of intelligence agencies to get uh, immigration also. So, so this is one problem that we face. Your, your information, Minister, aren't you? I mean, I, I, what are you doing to protect journalists? Because the case I refer to in the last 24 hours is by no means isolated. I just point you to one more in the recent past, last month. Absar Alam, a prominent journalist who was shot in broad daylight. He was lucky to survive the incident. This happens month after month, you've been in office for some time. What are you doing about it? Well, frankly, uh, individual incidents do happen, and uh, such incidents do happen everywhere in the world. And Pakistan is no exception. No, to no, that. Minister, but, uh, Minister, in they, they, incidents like this don't happen in many countries. The organisation reporters. Uh, without borders has clear evidence that the situation for journalists in Pakistan is much, much more dangerous than most other countries around the world. And you're clearly finding the situation deteriorating rather than improving. What are you doing about it? Well, I obviously would like to contest this claim again. The reason is that you are, uh, you, your, this question is is without context. The, the situation in Pakistan is not dangerous for journalists only. The situation in the past for Pakistan was dangerous for every citizen because we were fighting this war on terrorism. And yes, we uh, many journalists, especially the, the field journalists, uh, have been killed in this war, but uh, so are many other civilians. So this was not 
and uh, uh, not something that was limited to journalists. Every, even, you know, the former prime minister, Benazir Bhutto, was uh, actually assassinated in, in, in one of the terrorist attacks. So that uh, is a totally different context in which uh, uh, that figure uh, uh, actually uh, came But Minister, that. Minister, Minister, about, let, let me stop you for a second, if I may. The, the people who are carrying out these attacks on independent journalists are not the people you call terrorists. They are people who are working for the state. They are involved in the security and intelligence services. Reporters Without Borders says, quote, the influence of the military establishment, which cannot stand independent journalism, has increased dramatically since Imran Khan came to power. Impunity for crimes of violence against journalists is total. So again, the question, what are you doing about it? Well, the number of journalists, uh, the attacks on journalists has actually reduced since the Prime Minister Imran Khan has taken over. And uh, when you name uh, any Pakistani organization or intelligence agency, uh, you are bound to produce evidence of that as well. So all the incidents, those uh, as you have mentioned, were investigated and actually in most of the cases, the culprits were, uh, were apprehended. But in these two incidents that you have specifically mentioned, even investigation has not concluded. So I don't know under what pretext you have concluded that uh, the state must be involved in this uh, in this case. I, I, I don't see any reason of uh, this conclusion that you have opted to reach. This isn't just about the fact that individual journalists are being attacked and sometimes murdered. It's about the, the real limits this puts upon the ability of media operators to actually operate with independence and freedom. I'm going to quote you now Talat Hussein, a, a well-known journalist, host of a well-known TV show in your country on Geo TV. He said, long after Imran had come to power, he said, my programs have been repeatedly censored. I was told that any suggestion that the 2018 elections were rigged or that the army was part of running the government by Imran Khan was unacceptable. This is direct state interference in what the media in your country is allowed to say? Well, first, I don't even consider Talat Hussain a journalist because I don't see his program on television for, a, for much before Prime Minister Imran Khan took over his program was off rotated, not because of any reason, because he was not getting ratings. In Pakistan, the media, uh, uh, obviously, like any other media, is a commercial media. They look at the, uh, they obviously retain people who get ratings for them. And if Mr. Uh. Tandat Hussain and others, they couldn't get ratings, obviously, they have to be offloaded. As I told you earlier, uh, and I would again like to read, because I don't want to be, you know, that we have about uh, 112 private channels and 43 international channels. With this kind of theme, the mass media that we have, how can you intimidate media? How can state be accused of intimidating media? Pakistan, if you compare us with any other third world country, or you compare it even with the first world, we probably have most, more free media than probably first world. The BBC, I, I don't know whether you respect us as an independent news organization. We certainly strive to be independent and impartial. The BBC offered a half hour Urdu uh, news program to one of your channels. I think they're called AAJ TV. Uh, we had to, at the BBC, stop offering that half hour of news because AAJ TV was uh, not able to broadcast it without interfering with the BBC's editorial content. And it was clear that that interference came under pressure from the Pakistan authorities. Now, again, you are the information minister. You have a background working in the media yourself. You told me at the beginning of this interview you felt it was a key to any democracy to allow a free media. That is simply not happening in your country. Won't you even recognize that? So had we uh, thought uh, as aggressively as uh, you just mentioned about BBC, we would not have allowed BBC World to operate in Pakistan. But fact of the matter is that BBC World is one of the most watched international channel, channel in Pakistan and we have never you know, obstructed its uh, transmission by any means. So 
what happens in the case of Urdu channels? You have to abide by certain laws or local laws which was not complied with. If they comply today, they are allowed to do that. And just let me quote you one example uh, about the irresponsible attitude of uh, BBC Urdu here. Again, I would say I have a huge respect for uh, the BBC as an organization. There was a woman, Asia Bibi, who was freed from blasphemy charges. There was a headline on BBC Urdu that Holland ambassador has gone to receive her from the jail. So the Holland embassy had to close down for 10 days because they got threats after that news and that news was totally wrong. And unfortunately, BBC took no action against uh, their own people. So isn't the truth, is the isn't, isn't the truth, Minister, that when it comes to all of these issues, from attacks on individual journalists to censorship, systematic censorship, that in the end, you as Information Minister have no real power or control at all. There are other elements in the Pakistani state, some call them the deep state, who have powers that are far superior and dominate your own. I am the information minister of world's uh, fifth largest state. I am the information minister of one of the seven nuclear states of the world. No one can dare to undermine me. I am here with the full authority and I decide in Pakistan what will happen and what is happening. So can we say that it's your personal responsibility then, this new set of inter internet regulations that came into force towards the end of last year, which according both to independent media analysts and to some of the world's most powerful uh, internet media companies, including Google and Twitter, are extremely damaging to freedom of expression and reach a new level of state control on freedom of expression online in your country. Can you specify any regulation that is uh, that led you to conclude uh, th this? Uh, what you are just saying? Well, to be specific, under the new regulations, social media companies, internet service providers, they face huge fines of millions of dollars for failure to curb the sharing of content, which, to quote it, is deemed to be defamatory of Islam, promoting terror, hate speech, or in any content viewed as endangering national security. You add up all of those subjective uh, delineations together, and it gives the state enormous power to censor what is seen online in Pakistan? Well, frankly, uh, hate speech is a universally uh, recognized uh, thing, uh, is, if, uh, is a universally recognized fact that has to be called, and all the states are under, and organizations are under the duty uh, not to allow hate speech. As far as uh, the rest of the, uh, the, the, the law is codified, you know, Anything that endangers national security, who decides what endangers national security? That law has never been promulgated. That uh, the, the social media rules are under discussion and this, the, the part that you are referring to was never promulgated. What, you're saying that you're backing down? That is never going to become law, isn't it? Well, yes, this is, uh, right now this is a position, this is not the law. Interesting. So what, you've listened to all of the alarm that has been expressed by, for example, the Asia Internet Coalition, Google, Facebook, Twitter, many other companies involved in that, who said that they were desperately alarmed by the scope of this new law, as well as the opaque process by which the rules were developed. You've listened to them, have you? You now accept they were right to be so alarmed. No, I have a huge respect for these technology companies, and I will certainly listen to them. Because I want them to come and establish their offices in Pakistan and we want to do business with them. I have a huge respect for them and the contributions they have made to the world. I think uh, I am one of the most, I'm, 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 the, I'm the admirer of their work. Why would I not listen to them, number one? And number two is that uh, the, uh, the, the conclusions that uh, you have arrived at are actually uh, based on, uh, I would say, services. So uh, there is no problem as far as censorship is concerned. We would like to welcome all these companies and I would like them, I would, you know, in, uh, welcome them with open heart. When people consider Imran Khan's government, they 
try to compare it with what came before. Here are the words of Fazana Sheikh, a respected analyst of pa Pakistan at Chatham House, who says what's different about this government is the dropping of all pretense that it conducts policy independent of the military. Previous governments sparred with the top brass, but Imran Khan seems happy to do just as he is told. That's the perception your government has inside the country and outside. Well, this may be a perception of some uh, Indian influence think tanks. This is not the perception here in Pakistan. This is not the perception of independent people. I would say that Pakistan Imran Khan is uh, one of the most popular prime minister of Pakistan. And as I said earlier, don't undermine the elected government of Pakistan. Imran Khan is, has received more than uh, nearly about 200 million votes. It's not a joke. Imran Khan is a prime minister of a nuclear state. He takes the decision. The cabinet takes the decision. And yes, we have a very, very good relationship uh, with, uh, with the so-called establishment, uh, which uh, the term uh, you are using so often. Uh, we, they are part and parcel of Pakistan system. We have a huge respect for their opinion. But the decision making rests with the prime minister and the cabinet. You see, uh, if one looks at the facts, it seems Imran Khan is not prepared to take on the military, despite promises he made before he was elected. He repeatedly promised to end the decades of so-called disappearances, that is, opposition figures, journalists, uh, lawyers, human rights activists, who have disappeared in your country, not just under the tenure of Imran Khan, but over many years. But the truth is that since he became prime minister, those disappearances have continued, and in some areas and instances have actually increased in number. Again, why isn't the government confronting the ISI, the security establishment, the deep state? Uh, first, let me, let's be very clear. Pakistan's ISI, Pakistan's army, respects human rights just as any other civilian governments will do. They are one of the most civilized uh, army uh, of the world and uh, they are most responsible army of the world and people of Pakistan and the world uh, respects them for their uh, role, what uh, role they have played in, again, in, war, in war against terrorism. Uh, Minister, in, in, in eight months of 2020, 139 people were forcibly abducted in Balochistan, just one of your provinces. You're saying that your army is the most civilized in the world? Yeah. The reason uh, that these uh, missing person has a history. Uh, most of the missing persons were actually voluntarily gone into Afghanistan, into troubled areas. Huh. And then when, when they go on missing, you would use uh, you know, agencies in the state for that. And let me tell you, the least number of missing persons are reported in Imran Khan's government. We are the only government who have just passed a law against disappearance. We have made, you know, the illegal confinement as a criminal offense. And now the bill has been passed by the cabinet and it will go to the uh, go to the parliament. This is one leap forward in the cases of, uh, you know, enforced disappearance, as you have said. And also, please don't ignore the kind of background. Uh, Pakistan uh, background uh, in which the, all this, these cases were happened. We faced one of the worst uh, 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 wars in Pakistan. The terrorism, the kind of terrorism Pakistan faced, very few other nations could resist that. And the fact of the matter is that we lost 70,000 precious lives in that. And in, right. in, for example, in Guant what was Guantanamo Bay? It was it was a special measures those were taken. So don't misinterpret. Uh, this kind of, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't misinterpret the situation and make such conclusions. You, you told me just minutes ago that you believe Imran Khan was the most popular PM in Pakistan's history. I'm looking at a late April Gallup poll which shows 38% of respondents thought Pakistan was heading in roughly the right direction, but 41% now believe going in the wrong direction. If one looks at the economic woe of Pakistan under Imran Khan, the fact that you've had an unprecedented recession, the fact that even now growth rates are minimal and your unemployment and your poverty rates are really, really high, there's a profound problem. Imran's promises to the people have not been delivered. Actually, uh, unfortunately, again, I have to uh, you know, say that I don't agree with your conclusion. 
the right now pakistan's uh, growth rate is 3.98% 94% which is one of the highest in the world because despite all this covid uh, crisis that the world has faced and uh, this is another story that the way pakistan faced covid and what a success success story pakistan has created uh, as far as covid is yeah, concerned independent right economists now, uh, independent economists dispute that figure of 3.9% as you know very well they say growth this year is going to be around 1.5% you've got inflation running at 11% it was 14% the basic foodstuffs that your poorest people rely on are going up in price and you can tell me whatever you like but all of the independent evidence is that many many pakistanis who voted for imran khan are now deeply disappointed the the people uh, who voted for prime minister imran khan and pti are the still ardent fans and i believe that even in the next elections imran khan will get the maximum votes and will be the prime minister again but again i would like to dispute your take on the economy uh you see 1100 billion rupees uh, have been shifted from urban economy to rural economy in pakistan this year we have four bumper crops except cotton the wheat is the highest in the history of pakistan the maize is highest in the history of pakistan the rice is highest in the history wow. of pakistan sugarcane is the second highest in pakistan i would say i would i would suggest just go through the the consumption figures just go to the number of tractors uh, I, know, I understand minister I, I understand, Mr. Minister. I, un I understand it's your job to put a positive gloss on the situation. That's that's what you're paid to do. How do you put a positive gloss on the fact that only one percent of your population thus far has been vaccinated against COVID-19? Now that compares. Admittedly, the crisis in India is much deeper than in Pakistan, but they have at least vaccinated 11 percent. In the UK, it's getting on to well over 60 percent of the population have had a first dose. Why is Pakistan one of the world laggards when it comes to vaccination? Well, again, please allow me to uh, read this quote from the UN General Assembly President Volkan Bazgar. He said Pakistan has been good example for the world with its pandemic related policies. Pakistan has done better than other countries One of the world. 1% of and your and people are vaccinated, minister. You don't need to read that arms. off a card. You know it and no, I know no, no, no. it. I, I, I'm quoting you, the President of General Assembly, and I don't want to be wrong. You know, as far as uh, you know, the uh, vaccines are concerned, right now I think uh, we have vaccinated about 5.5 million people. We are among the 34 top countries in the world, though, uh, uh, in, in, as far as vaccinations are concerned. We have to end, but here's some very salutary words from Samin Sadiqi, a former director at the WHO, about Pakistan and the challenges ahead, particularly the dangers. Given your vaccination rate of a future COVID crisis, he says our systems will not be able to deliver. God forbid, if we reach even a bit of what is happening in neighbouring India, does that give you sleepless nights too? Well, frankly, Pakistan, as far as COVID is concerned, Pakistan is a great success story. The partial lockdown strategy that Prime Minister Imran Khan implemented in Pakistan was a great success. Only 2.2 percent mortality rates right now, and uh, the overall COVID is less than six percent. This is far better than any other country in the region. Fawad Chowdhury in Islamabad. We have to end there. I thank you very much indeed for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you.